and welcome to the meeting of the Holyoke School Committee. It is 6.15 p.m. Um, Ms. LaFon, roll call, please. Present. 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 Here. Present. Present. Here. Here. All rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty, justice for all. So really quick, I'm here by informing all attendees that a video and audio recording is being made of the meeting and the meeting is being shown live on the city's community TV channel. And before we go any further, I'm sure many are aware of what's happening in um, La Isla del Encanto, Puerto Rico, um, the earthquakes, how it's affecting many of our residents, families, friends. Um, many of our students are being impacted um, because of the fa their families that they have over there. And so I like to take this moment of this moment to have a, s a moment of silence. I said moment too many times. So for a moment of silence, please. Thank you, everyone. Liz, anyone for public discussion? None? OK. So we're going to start off this evening with the student showcase from Peck School. Yeah, so we're going to invite up uh, Principal Miss Graveline to the front, with, and she has a whole host of students with her and family members. And I see Dean Santiago. Where are you, Dean? Oh, right here, who's the parent engagement um, coordinator at Peck School. Uh, I have to thank Peck for, um, they were asked not too long ago to be our showcase today, and they turned this around really quickly with a full presentation. So I want to invite Peck School up to the front so they can share the good work that's happening um, on their campus. Good evening, members of the committee. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I'll be at a last minute notice. Um, we're really psyched to show off the good work that we've been doing at PEC. We have lots of friends here who are really excited to share the work that we've been doing with Summit Learning, which is the approach to learning that we take at PEC. We also have been the recipients of the VILS grant, which means that all of our middle school students have an awesome iPad, which Genesis will show off to you. And we're also going to talk a little bit about our art program here at PEC. And I'm also going to remind my friends that they need to speak loud and proud into this microphone so that the people on, on the other side of the camera, home watching you, because you guys are now movie stars or rock stars, um, can hear your voices, OK? OK, so who are we? We have Genesis Davila, one of our lovely eighth grade friends. We have Julio Rivera, seventh grade. We have Ethan Mateo, this tall guy behind me. Uh, we have Leska Rodriguez, to my right. And we have Smiley Matos Gonzalez, right to my left. OK, so at PEC, we have core values. Our core values are respectful, responsible, and ready to learn. They are the values that drive everything that we do uh, throughout the school day. A few things that make our school awesome are the innovative learning grant that we got from Verizon, Summit Learning. And again, we have an awesome, amazing art teacher that couldn't make it today. Her name is Ms. Vanessa Kirby. Genesis refers to her as her art mom. Um, and we have a really great art program at PEC. So we have the best artists. Here's a couple of examples of Genesis's amazing work. And she's going to come up and tell you a little bit about it. So um, I've been drawing since kindergarten, basically. 
And most of my artwork is inspired by my mom. And <laughs> movie, movies, basically. Um, my family members and people that I look up to. That's basically it. Okay, so at PEC, through the use of our iPads, we use technology in our daily learning. Genesis is going to tell you the first line about how we use technology in our daily learning. You mean I don't have to crouch down? Like, come on, I was doing awesome. <laughs> All right, we can pass the mic now. Oh, this is better. I have freedom. All right, Genesis, start us off. Over 38, over, <laughs> over 38 percent. Oh, 83 percent of our middle school students have an iPad with a data plan, thanks to Verizon and Digital, digital Promise. We, we use iPads in class to complete exit, ticket, exit tickets and engage in reviews and research topics for our classes. The iPads are also giving us access to the Summit Online Learning Platform, both at school and at home. We are learning about how, the, how to be responsible digital citizens and use technology to make our changes in our world. The world. We also have the opportunity to engage in STEM-related activities and about and learn about STEM-related careers as we prepare for high school. Great, and then we're also learning the skills and habits associated with lifelong learning and self-directed success through the Summit Learning Curriculum. Academic tenacity I look beyond short-term concerns and will and withstand challenges to persevere towards long-term <laughs> academic goals curiosity I take an, an interest in a wide variety of topics and desire deep and complete understanding of couple topics Growth mindset. I can grow my abilities and my comp you know, with with effort. I'm not done learning and growing. Self direction. I have a desired outcome, backwards plan, take action and evaluate the effectiveness of my choices and make adjustments to move towards my goals. So self awareness. I recognize my own emotions and thoughts and see how my they influence influence my Behaviors and impact others. All right, so really quickly, I just wanted to also say that the kiddos that are standing up here were nominated by their teachers. So I sent an email out to staff, said we had this incredible opportunity, and asked them for some names. And so these are the kiddos that were chosen and nominated by their teachers to come speak in front of you, go, you folks tonight. So really, really proud of them. So we want to say thank you for the opportunity. And also are happy to answer any questions you have for us. Anyone have any questions? Just out of curiosity, what's an exit ticket? Oh, who wants it? Yes. It's basically your ticket to get it, basically to go to your next class. If you don't finish it, then you have to stay and basically finish it. Basically your ticket out. It also is like a show what you know at the end of the class. I thought that you couldn't leave the classroom to go to your next class because you didn't finish the first one, but okay. All well, right. you know, we have really high expectations, <laughs> and we make sure that the kids do all of their work in class, so kind of. Okay. Can, can one of you describe what Summit Learning is? Summit Learning is an online platform which we can uh, take assessments on and see our grades through and show what, basically what we know. Okay, can I ask a question about the... the you, you seem to know it real well. So <laughs> yeah. um, when you, can you tell me about that dashboard where you can see like your progress and there's a line? Can you tell me like how that help? 
What does that What does that tell you when you can? When you can you basically up? like encourage yourself to get to uh, put your grade up more because if you're like a little bit down, you can like be encouraged to be uh-huh. up more like an A or B. But does it tell you if you're on track, off track? Yeah, it tells you if you're off, if you're on track or on track in each subject area. Yeah. And can you can you see that at home? Yeah. And your parents could see it at home too. Yep. Do you show your parents? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-huh. Is it only the times that you're on track that you're showing it out of curiosity? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Just checking. <laughs> Mr. Kershain. Is that is that part of um the whole is the whole school on that or just seventh and eighth grade or what's the situation with that? So historically it started off in one cohort in sixth grade. We expanded it to middle school and then this last year expanded it in grades four through eight. Okay, so it's four through eight. It was formerly called P3, too, when we first introduced it. You may remember, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, four yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, but it, yeah. we, now, we now are using the name that they use nationally, which is Summit Learning. But it's oh, just, Okay. Um, so, but it did start initially at just middle six. It was just seven. It was eight. one group of sixth graders, and then they expanded it to the middle school at large. Yeah. And now this last year, we expanded it in grades four through eight. And how do teachers like using it as well? I mean, it's dated. you got to be very data driven you know and you find that the teachers participate and and I you know I kind of like that's like kind of a thing we talk about a lot here is trying to get schools onto a system that everybody participates in and also unfortunately like parents too I really think that's important but certainly yeah the teachers really love it um it took a while for everybody to like fully embrace it, right? But there's lots of professional development opportunities. So teachers go to a summit in the fall, the spring, and in the summer um, to get lots of professional development around it. What I really love about summit and what the teachers like about it is it's real-time data. So you can log in any minute of the day and find out exactly where the kids are at, what they need work on. Um, and there's a lot of also opportunities um, like my friend was saying, to, to push yourself and exceed what you ever thought was possible or to catch up on things that you need work on. Um, there's also a really critical component to Summit Learning, which I consider critical, is mentoring. So every student has a mentor. They have a teacher who's their champion. And they talk about not just the content of the curriculum, but how to be a lifelong learner, sort of like the soft skills around that. Mr. Colomore. Uh- <coughs> The art pictures I saw up there, was that just by done by one student or other students? <laughs> it was drawn by me. Very, very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Miss Tensley Williams, how do you pick who's going to be in art? Is, do they volunteer or do you have a program just for art also? We have an art program, but all of the students at Peck have art. It's pretty amazing. Uh, can I just ask? So we, uh, you guys, all have iPads, right? How? How? I'm, it made me a little worried, right? Giving middle schoolers iPads, <laughs> right? How's that going? Are people using it for the right reason, reasons? And are, do you feel like people are t- t- taking good responsibility of the devices? Yes, um, people take good responsibility and they use it for the right reasons. We mostly use them for the summit learning program and other resources that we might need for it. And are they breaking a lot, or are no. they? They're all fine. All fine. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> We've had very little damage, which I was actually, as a school leader, surprised and nervous about, right? But what's really cool is that the kids have their own iPad. It's something that is theirs, um, that they have ownership of, and that they get to take home and use at home, which is also pretty cool. Yeah, so STEM and Peck are the two schools, but not uh, not the fourth and fifth graders at Peck. Six, six, six eight. seventh, and eighth, and then the sixth, seventh, and eighth graders at STEM each have their own iPads. Wow! And it's our first effort as a district to have one to one, and we're using them to. We're not using you, but we are learning from you in this first year as whether this is something we want to do across the district and at high school and eventually at the high school level as well. We were the chosen ones, right? That's right. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Dr. Shari, just out of clarification, so the P3 now just expanded to where it's the whole 6th to 8th is kind of like your P3. 
Four through eight. Four through, Four through eight. eight. Yeah, it's it, mm. it, it, the name changed, but the pr the model didn't change. So don't get confused. We just decided to go with a name that the national name Summit Learning, so that it wouldn't be confusing to people. Well, thank you guys so much for coming. Did you want to get a picture? Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yes, we would love pictures. Sure. I know of one mother in particular that would like a picture. Let's have a representative from the school committee. Be okay. okay. That's what, what happens when you become vice chair. That's right. You're in it all. Strike a pose. <laughs> Are you going to take a picture? Cut this. What a great kid. Very outspoken. Good. Come on in. Carlos must have been good, Sam. What one am I? Jeez. How are you? Don't worry, I'll, I'll hug you when I see you at the store. I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. Someone would gave that to me. How are you doing, sweetheart? Oh, I'll sorry. See you at the store. Oh, he's beautiful. Very handsome. Nice to meet you, sweet. Mucho gusto in yourself. We watch photos here. <laughs> Alex is the man. Remembers my name. Oh, everybody say Casey. I'm going to pass it over to you. Sure. I bet you too. The bigger blue boy. Can I see what it reads? He's adorable. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Because I'm sure they've had some <laughs> less this year. That is nice. Down. Thank you guys. And now I'm going to pass it on over to Mr. Sheehan. Thank you. So I have a, a presentation to make, and I'm going to speak here first, and then I'll invite up our uh, person for the presentation. So a, as many of you know, and I have a little history lesson here too. Uh, Massachusetts passed a comprehensive education reform in 1993. It um, changed the ways that education works here in the Commonwealth, including the the funding model. and And things were good. Massachusetts became first in the nation. Um, we, at the time, adequately funded uh, many of our schools across the state, and it was a a big hope for our students back in 1993. Well, well, things changed, society changed, the world changed, and education changed, and uh, we had to start begging for more money to educate our students. And uh, our urban centers uh, were hit hard uh, through uh, different uh, funding mecha mechanisms around charter schools, and regional schools were hit hard because uh, regional transportation was never fully funded, and special ed costs weren't funded appropriately. And we, we fought hard with the legislature for many, many years uh, to update that. And uh, we saw many road bumps along the way. But luckily this year, um, we were very fortunate to have a uh, brave and courageous team of legislators that worked hard to get the Student Opportunity Act passed. 
and um, no one else could get it done. And we here in Holyoke are fortunate that one of those people that really uh, championed the effort for the Student Opportunity Act and what we had and really put it all out on the line uh, is our own uh, state rep, uh, Aaron Vega. He was joined with uh, Representative Keefe out of the Worcester area and on the Senate side, Senator Ch Sonia Chang-Diaz, who worked very hard for many years. And um, I know that we as a school committee are grateful and the Hoyle Public Schools are grateful for the money that's going to be coming into Hoyle, but I thought it would be appropriate for us to recognize Representative Vega for his hard work. And he's here today with his uh, wife, Deborah, and son, Odin. And I'm going to invite any of them that want to come up. And I'll take a photo. What's on here, because I think it's important. So, the Hoyoke School Committee and Hoyoke Public Schools recognizes State Representative Aaron Vega for his leadership on the Student Opportunity Act. His courage, passion, and dedication will ensure that the youth of Holyoke and of the Commonwealth will receive high quality education they deserve. And we added in a quote in here from Theodore Roosevelt In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing, and the worst thing you can do is nothing. And I think that's something that means a lot with this. And uh, I can't tell you how appreciative I am for what you've done on this. Uh, having also served as the uh, State Association School Committee President, um, we worked hard together on this. And just to see this happen and get to say it was my rep who really did this. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, no, that's uh, Deborah's. Well, hot mic. Well, thank you, uh, you know, deeply. I, we don't do this work to get plaques and awards, but it does feel uh, nice to get recognized uh, for putting it all on the line. So first, congratulations to all of you on your re-election and your re election, so welcome. Uh, and I would say that uh, first and foremost, this wasn't done uh, by myself. Uh, there was, as, as Devin mentioned, other reps involved, uh, some of my colleagues, but really Devin, and Dennis Burks were two of the people that really early on when I was elected really brought this issue to me about uh, education funding. So the three quick things that three quick things I would say uh, I would give a shout out to my colleagues, uh, the Black Latino Caucus, the Progressive Caucus, uh, and the Gateway Saves Caucus. Uh, these three groups really came together um, and focused in on the one big issue around education, around Chapter 70, which was the low income, economically disadvantaged funding line. Uh, and that was always the big difference, and we really got the house to step up and do what needed to be done. The second Second thing I would say is that for a lot of my colleagues and a lot of people, they've called this like a game changer. Jeez, <laughs> this guy's in charge. Um, I don't think this is a game changer for Holyoke because two things. I think that this is money that's been due to us for decades. Uh, this cities like Holyoke and Springfield and Worcester and Fall River and our gateway cities have been underfunded drastically, and um, the results have shown uh, how that affects 
education abilities in our district and our teachers and giving them the supports they need. It's not the cure-all. There are other issues, of course, uh, but funding is a major issue. Um, so for me, I see this as our ability now with all of you to do what we know works, to get things done, to expand pre-K uh, full day, to expand dual language, to expand STEM, to incorporate arts, uh, to have all the good things that Ian White, for sure, that's already going on, but to keep doing what you're already doing and stop relying, on grant, relying so much on grants. Don't quote me exactly, and I know we have the numbers uh, back. You know, we'll see how things play out. But estimates, you know, if you look at, if you look at, uh, where did everybody go? Everybody left. <laughs> um, this is a seven-year implementation, and if you looked at the status quo in seven years, Hoyok would stand to get about 109 million dollars uh, in Chapter 70 for school funding. This puts us at about 147 million dollars. So this is a significant uh, amount of money that we can do some great things with. And the last thing I would say, um, again, thank you to all of you, is that. Um, as we mentioned, this doesn't fix everything. Uh, we still uh, have other issues to attend to, especially uh, out of district placements, transportation, and other issues. But I think that um, this has been a huge step for the legislature, and again, to recognize that in 1993, what we did for education, other states still have not followed our lead. And again, we've doubled down and made sure that education is a priority for everybody in the Commonwealth, no matter where you're from. Because all of us have said at one time or another, where you're born and your zip code shouldn't matter your opportunities, but we know damn well it does. And we've got to fix that, and that's what this tries to do. So thank you for, to all of you. Keep up the great work. Looking forward to working with you for the next year or more. All right. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. What, one thing I forgot to mention, too, is the other huge thing that Aaron secured for all of us that I will say has probably been a huge legacy project, I think, for everyone in the Commonwealth is actually breakfast after the bell. And I think that whereas the Student Opportunity Act is big, I think that this leadership on Breakfast After the Bell, I mean, is a, a huge program, not only for Hoyoke, but for everyone. So it's always looking out for our students who need it the most. Can we book him for the next showcase? Yeah. Ian, you know, we need Ian White. <laughs> we get him the whole meeting, though, because they're going to go out. So this is Ronnie's 41st year serving on um, the school committee. So. And many more years serving the city, as he was a firefighter before that, so just as a public servant. So thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, Mr. Collimore. We love you. So we were going to move on to student reports, but they're not here with us this evening. So we're going to go ahead and move on into educator preparation and recruitment pipelines. Yeah, so uh, I just want to introduce um, our uh, chief of um, talent, uh, Beth Gage, and our lead star recruiter, Kelly Curran, um, who are going to share a little bit about our efforts um, to recruit um, and retain um, effective educators in the Holyoke Public Schools. Um, you do know that we just received a grant, a diversification grant um, from the Department of Education. They're going to talk a little bit about that. I, I do just want to acknowledge that over the last four years, we really shifted from uh, doing a lot of outside recruiting to uh, wanting to uh, developing programs that are incentivizing people that are already in our system and in our community to take on um, educator roles in the Holyoke Public Schools. So paraprofessionals, um, recent college grads who are from the community, um, and even uh, some of our own teachers that maybe don't have their uh, master's, have a bachelor's, but need to get their certification and their master's. And so we, we now have about as robust a suite of options available to, ed to educators um, who want to teach in the Holyoke Public Schools. We, it's no secret we have uh, uh, we have significant turnover every year as a school system. Uh, while we've seen some um, improvements, um, I, I, no one is satisfied with our level of retention. I, I don't want to, um, I'm, I'm concerned. I do think it's something this, the, the school system's going to have to continue to uh, grapple with for, um, for, a, for a while. It's a challenging place to work. We have um, longer hours. Uh, the work, there's intensity in the work. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't get better. 
Um, and so we are moving towards what I think is a, um, the incentivizing of our current educators to take the next step in their careers. And I think you've heard me say, like, the best, I think, um, the best way we're going to be able to retain more educators is to get people who are really committed to the city to, to come teach in our schools. And some of those people, many of those people, I should say, are paraprofessionals who are working in our schools every day. That, that I've, I, It took me a couple years to get to that place, but I really believe that the future of the teaching force here is – by incentivizing on folks who have given their whole careers, they have children in the school system who want to be in our schools and incentivizing them to get their bachelor's and come back to teach. Well, some of them already have their bachelor's and our paras, but many of them don't. And how do we figure out pipelines for them? And then how do we take our students, our current students, and bring them back to the, the community? I think that's the best chance, the best option we have for improving our retention. And I, so I, what I want to do is have Beth and Kelly give you what I think is the most comprehensive look at all the pipelines that we have. Uh, about three weeks ago, they presented this to principals. Our principals, I think, were surprised to see all the options in one place because I don't even think we were, I don't know that we were doing the best job of showing or um, articulating the menu that we now offer people. And then we did a presentation for the central office staff who are often Many people, many of them live in the community, and they interface with folks, and they were surprised, wow, we offer this much. So I don't think we've done a good enough job telling our story. So this is an effort to really tell the story and let you answer, ask questions about what we offer to people. So with that, I'm going to shut my mouth. Beth, you are okay. up. So, I, yeah, just echoing everything Steve said, I think um, particularly for myself and Kelly this year, we have been participating in the state's diversity network um, where we also collaborate with Mark Swagger and Stephen Mogel. And uh, we kind of had this aha moment that, like, we just haven't done a very good job about training the public about what is available in Holyoke for um, becoming a, an educator in the district. So uh, we would invite you guys to just really look at this with the lens of, like, do I know someone who could enter into right. one of these pipelines um, and help us to promote them here in Holyoke? Um, so just to start with, we're going to look at our vision. I think you all have seen this before, but our vision um, for talent is to attract, select, develop, and retain highly effective educators who demonstrate a commitment to the HPS values and have a significant impact on students' to success. Um, we are excited that uh, this is our first year that we've launched our diversity and equity commitment website. Um, so there is a link on the HR page where you can really get a general overview of everything you're going to hear today. In addition, you'll also see a few additional pipelines that we have for leadership development on there as well. Um, but it is, it's just speaking to some of the work that we've been doing in human resources and really across the district with the schools. Um, I'm going to start by presenting um, our pipelines for candidates with a bachelor's degree. This is where we've spent the majority of our time developing pipelines into teaching, just knowing the urgency that we need um, people now, so the shortest pathway to getting certified educators. Um, to start with, uh, really difficult to see on the screen, hopefully it's a little clearer in your package, but this is the Urban Teacher Pathway, which was established in 2015. Um, this is our longest established pathway in the district, and uh, we're, we're now recruiting for our sixth cohort, is that right, Kelly? Sixth cohort, um, so that application process, application and selection process is currently happening, um, and that cohort will begin in the summer. Um, and be in the classroom this fall. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, this is a partnership that we have with <coughs> Mount Holyoke. They've been a really supportive partner. Um, it was really designed to address our critical shortage areas, special education and ELL. This is uh, unique in the sense that you actually come out with two certifications in this program. So you have to choose either special education or ELL, but then you get to choose an additional license um, in a, a general content area. 
Um, so you get a master's degree and two certifications, and it's a two-year program. Um, as I mentioned, you start right away in the classroom. We do start on a waiver, and then you get your initial license following the program. Yeah, so it's just uh, to add, like teachers like many of you know, uh, Kate O'Donnell and Bevan Brunel, they participated in, I mean, they've been in front of us. Many of you know who they are. They were part of the original cohort, I think, right? Was that the, yes. the first Correct. cohort? And now we're up to six. Yeah, so um, with that, we, we've opened this to anybody in the district who has a bachelor's degree, um, particularly paraprofessionals um, and educators on a waiver. So that's who's eligible for this program. You do have to be a current HPS employee to qualify for the program. Um, the benefits of the program is that you actually get 50% off your tuition at Mount Holyoke, um, and they also help support candidates through applying for um, grants and things like that. The TEACH grant is $7,000. That's the big one that they provide a lot of support with. Additionally, um, this might vary year to year, but historically, um, Holyoke has contributed an additional $3,000 um, towards their tuition for a three-year commitment after completion of the program. Um, and then... Um, additionally, this program is affiliated with the Paradigm Shift, um, who can help candidates pass the MTELs. They have waivers, um, so they have vouchers so that people don't have to pay to take the MTELs, and they provide coaching and mentoring for those who struggle to take the test. Kelly, anything you want to add to that before we move on? Okay. Next, we'll move on to the Teach Western Mass program. Um, this is for candidates who also have a bachelor's degree and do not hold a certification. Um, we currently offer ESL special education and middle school math certification through this program. Um, it, it is a little... It's an alternative pathway that's accelerated. Um, with that being said, it gets you initial certification in one of those content areas. It does not get you the master's degree, um, but they do have an affiliation with AIC um, to, for people to complete their master's degree. Um, so there is a little bit of a cost, but um, they are 60% of the way. Is that correct, Kelly? Yes. 60% um, of the way towards their master's degree um, after completion of the program. Um, again, one of the big benefits of that program is that it is accelerated, um, so they will start coursework this summer. There is an application that actually goes directly through Teach Western Mass. Um, anybody can apply to that nationally. Um, however, we're really launching a campaign for internal candidates to apply for it this year. Um, this is really the first year we've focused on internal candidates for these programs, and we're working to develop information sessions for our um, candidates who already have a bachelor's degree. Um, cost of the program is $11,000 um, in total. $4,000 of that is the district's responsibility, and then $7,000 is the employee, the um, participants responsibility. Uh, we are happy to announce that with the teacher diversification grant, we are able to award 17 residents a scholarship to cover the cost in full with a commitment to Holyoke. So that was just awarded to us this year, um, and we're really excited about that. So if you know anyone, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay. I think that brings us to our... And I would just add to that, it's like when we say it's, we want, it could also be people who live in Holyoke or not in the system right now, but have always thought about teaching and mm -hmm. want to do an accelerated, uh, you know, and you know, that would be great with kids. This is a really accelerated way to get in the, into the classroom and, um, and, and, and be on the path towards certification. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it, yeah, if you know folks that are in the community that are likely to stick with us, um, this would be a great option for them. Right, and now would be a great time because this money is not guaranteed. Like yep. next year or the following year, we got a grant and we have to spend it this year. So, Mr. Christian, um, I just had a quick question. It's like um, for the Mount Holyoke, the Urban Teacher Pathway Program on the first first page, 
Um, do you have figures that, you know, it's 50% off of the tuition. What is the tuition? We do have those figures not with us, but okay. it, it comes down to only a couple thousand dollars for your master's. It depends on if somebody wants one certification, two certifications, where they're at um, when they go. Like if they have a bachelor's degree, that's not – like if they're going to be a math teacher and their bachelor's degree has no math content, they might have to take a few extra courses in math. So it depends on where the, um, the student is at. I'm just, I'm just looking at this like you know, to sell it, I would want to know that. Right. Yeah, and, that's a good point. And then – um, sixty percent of a uh, master's at AIC. What does it cost for the other forty percent? Mm -hmm. Just for someone, I'm going to invest in this. Mm -hmm. What's my total investment going to be? You know, I mean, this is all really great, and I'm like, I get excited about it. But I'm like, okay, if I was trying to <coughs> figure out my path as a professional, what would my total investment have to be? And then that would be very enticing, I think. Mm -hmm. And how how many people do you normally get? So seventeen residents will be given that. Grant, how many are you getting usually? So they are expanding the residency this year. So this past year we have our 13. 13. Okay. So, okay, so yeah. everybody would get it then. If you had 13 again, you had 17. Yeah. Right, yes. So that's great. Yep. Wow. We have 13 Teach Western Mass this year. Total. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Current um, people from last year and then people we have. I think it's eight new, new this year. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and regarding the Urban Teacher Pathway Program, Niles, Mount Holyoke College has um, great um, leaders there that work with our teachers to determine, like, exactly what the cost will be, what their schedule will be. So they would know that before they um, committed. Ms. Tensley-Williams? I'm, I'm a little bit confused. The candidate, $7,000, the person that's applying for it would pay or? Yes. The participant in the program would pay for that. Yeah. Mr. Sheehan? Yeah. I'm curious why the commitment on the Canada is different between the Mount Hook, pro Mount Hook program and the Teach Western Mass, considering HPS is actually paying more for Teach Western Mass than they are for Mount mm -hmm. Hook, why the, the years of service commitment is different. Um, part of that is to be competitive. Um, so there are other partners in Teach Western Mass who are offering the two years. So we don't want someone to be deterred by having to commit an extra year and having that be a deciding factor. So we tried to stay on par with the other partners who are offering scholarships. Yeah, I, I don't know if I agree with that, especially if this year we're paying for FY20, we're paying the full amount. I mean, are other partners paying the full amount? Yes. Okay. There are. It just seems like if we're going to have a commitment, I would say that it should probably be something similar. I mean, we're the district is investing more money into yeah. one program and expecting less time, whereas Mount Hook program, it's more money and that they're invest or it, more money. Can, or less can money I interrupt, Devin? So the Mount Holyoke program gives them 50% off. Like if they weren't a teacher in Holyoke, they wouldn't get 50% off of their tuition. So that's, if you, you know, count the thousands of dollars, it's almost equal. More of a reason with my point that you're requiring someone to attend the Mount Holyoke program and make a three-year commitment, whereas you're going to the Teach Western Mass program and you're only making a two-year commitment to the district. I don't necessarily disagree with you. I can totally understand where you're coming from. I'll be honest, it has been our experience. Um, like, for example, we've offered to pay for people to go back and get their master's degrees for commitments um, with ELMS. And to be honest, people turned us down because they were uh, afraid to make that commitment. And so uh, with that experience, we did decide that this was the right avenue because other people are offering that lesser commitment and knowing that we've had even internal candidates who have turned us turned money away um, because of that factor. So we really, to make, to get us the highest quality candidate, we don't want anything interfering with our offer. We want to put forth our most competitive offer right up front before they take someone else into consideration. We can, I'm happy to discuss more too, um, and about like what you think is the right answer. Like, what is the balance with that? Yeah, I, I'm not sure if I, I know what the balance is. It just, I mean, it just seems like there's just something more aligned. Like, and I. 
think it's a little surprising too that someone would not make a few year commitment to get a free master's. Like there's a lot to unpack with mm -hmm. what you just said. I mean, with all of that, yep. uh, but it just seems like the programs would have similar, especially because they would have similar stipulations, especially because on paper, the district commitment, the commitment the district's making is so much greater um, in, in price for the teach Western mass program than it is for the Mount Holyoke program. That's an, that I, I'm glad you, that's a, I'm glad you raised it because this is the first year that we'll have the teacher diversification grant that will pay the full amount. So it's 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 worth us having a follow up about that. I think it's an uh, you know that's new to us this year, and so we're you are you're right. We're making a bigger financial commitment there, which um, and, you know, yeah, and also ahead. last year the teacher diversification grant did pay for um, um, eight people's. For, for the Urban Teacher Pathway Program, total tuition. So whatever they owed, including what we were offering. So that's probably why we have that on here right now, but we can discuss changing it in the future. And since the Mount Hope Program has been the longest, what have been the retention numbers for the people who have completed it um, that have stayed in the district, and how long have they stayed in the district after they've completed it? Yeah, it's a, a really good question, um, and I'll be honest, it's probably not something that we've tracked very well over the years, so we can pull that data for you, um, I, and it is something that we want to look into so that we can really strengthen these pipelines even more. Yeah, the first group didn't have a commitment, though, in Correct. Mount Holyoke, so uh, there are, some of those folks did. I, I mean, commitment or not, it would just be interesting yeah. to see yeah, like, the way I people... Agree. I think the retention rates have been good for years, too, on. Mm -hmm. um, for Mount Holyoke. Off yeah. the top of my head, there's probably a handful of people that are no longer with us from the Mount Holyoke program. Particularly from that first group where from there the was first not, group, yeah. uh, there wasn't a commitment. Sure. And uh, it was just kicking off too. I, I just, one real. Oh, Mr. Cushane. One real quick question. Ha, has anyone um, uh, talked to um, People's Bank or Holyoke Credit Union about maybe, um, trying to work out some kind of uh, like uh, down payment assistance for a home if you, you know, get into something like this, just because that sometimes like that's like a good way yeah. to. Right. So we met with, um, who was it, Dr. Jarek? Testing me. Sorry, Kelly. I know um, I put you on the spot. We did have this um, conversation with one of the banks. Aaron, who, in, in the, the people that you were associated with, I forget their names. By Holyoke, by Holyoke now. now, yes. Some of the, um, a couple people from that there and some mortgage lenders. Um, but we did, we have talked about trying to do that. We just. Sorry, I think one of the main things with getting something like that done is the district would have to put a residency requirement, um, most likely. And I don't think you can do that. Right, I mean. Well, banks, I mean, I don't, why would it have to be a residency yeah. requirement, or can it be an incentive to live uh, in Holyoke? Yeah, so sometimes something can, like that can be done with a cooperative of a of a of a of a community bank can put on, like a, a loan program that has a forgivable second mortgage. So it's like uh, like your down payment money, like ten thousand dollars, is often used in low income housing programs where. Be ten thousand dollars that's forgivable, you know, like um, five percent per year. Uh, so long as you remain a teacher with the Holyoke School District, you do something like that. I'm just, I'm just trying to think of ways that you yeah. might, you know, as far as keeping people in the program. I and mean, these are really awesome incentives, you know, right. and really exciting. But just, you know, another idea. Yeah, I'd love to follow up it. with some of the people on yeah, this committee that know this space really Considering well. Considering that, I would go after Peoples because they're the only local under that portfolio's loans. Holyoke Credit Union doesn't. They sell everything to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and that probably won't fly. Um, but so I would try Peoples first. Thank you. Go ahead. All right. Uh, we will go on to Teach for America. Um, so Teach for America, uh, similar to the Teach Western Mass Residency, it is an alternative accelerated pathway into teaching. Um, core members do have to give two, a two-year commitment. Um, 
and the they provide them with initial cert the classes to get initial certification. Um, we actually met with them just today, um, and they can actually get a master's degree from BU for a total of about two thousand um, dollars because they get both an AmeriCorps stipend and then they. Um, also get a 33% discount through TFA. Um, so, it, you know, this is one area where we know like there is turnover because of that two-year commitment with TFA. Um, however, Josh Lauren has been a really good partner and started participating in the paradigm shift and is committed to starting to do more of this recruitment locally. Um, another one of their goals is to um, build communities within the schools. So um, you have to be a designated site in order to have TFA mem uh, core members in your building. Um, and the thought behind that is that you're more likely to stay and be retained after the two years if there's a community that exists within the school. Um, so we are going to be working closely with him to have TFA participate in our information session for different pipelines into teaching. Um, so we're hoping to see some local recruits there as well. Um, similar to the residency program, also the this is a national program, so anybody can apply and you have to have your bachelor's degree um, with an interest in teaching. Um, our current locations, uh, they're currently Peck, Donahue, Donahue, and Holyoke High School. Um, we are talking about possibly changing those locations in upcoming years, so we'll give you an update if any of that does change. But those would be the three schools you would have to work in if you were to participate in this program. And then the last one... In this section is um, a partnership. We've really uh, worked closely with Elms College over the last year. Um, I have to say they've been really flexible and accommodating with us. Um, really interested to hear about Holyoke and the challenges we face um, and how they can support us in our work. Um, one of the things that they've launched is the Center for Equity and Urban Education. Um, and we are able to offer master's degree through that program. Um, last year, we did get some money from the teacher diversification grant to support this effort. Um, the students pay $2,500 I'm sorry, $2, per year. Um, HPS also contributes $2,580. Um, and then they have some local donors who also contribute to that. Um, so again, a very discounted rate for the candidate to get their a master's degree, which leads to certification. Mr. Colomar? Yeah, who selects the schools that are, you go to? For Teach for America? Right. Um, usually we look at where we have alum and um, we, we build it around that typically. Um, so currently we have Rod Hart at Donahue, who is supervised by Tiffany Curtis, um, who are both alum of TFA. Um, and then at Holyoke High School, um, who do we have there? That's, I'm forget. yeah. I'm forgetting who it is, but that that's one of the uh, factors. Okay. Again, just getting they they want twenty percent of the school to be TFA members. Um, again, so that people tend to stick around longer than that two year commitment. Okay, very yeah. good. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Sheehan. Are they even? You just mentioned they want twenty percent of the school to be TFA members to maintain a site, right? Is that? So, yeah. at does Dunyu, Peck, and Hoyok High all have twenty percent? No. No. Um, the high school is probably the biggest ex exception to that. Um, I they only have a couple candidates right now. Um, again, they've been pretty flexible with us, um, and 
they, they've they worked with the leadership in the building to talk about the programming and how it aligns to their vision. Um, so I think they've been flexible and we have talked about over time, if we can't build it up to that 20%, how do we filter those people maybe into another site location or develop a new site location where we can build it up? So I, I don't think you need to launch it at 20%, but the goal is to build it up to 20%. Are they even, is Teach for America realistically even bringing enough candidates no. to Holyoke or to Western Mass that you could ever get three sites at 20% in a five-year period? Uh, I think that depends on the retention of them. Um, I mean, I w we're hiring about five to 10 a year um, and with the launch of like an additional location that's gonna grow. Um, so I think there is potential for that. Their goal this year is 35 between Holyoke and Springfield. And, and that concern is why we're also trying to get people internally to participate in the program so that they'll stay and get a certification within a year. And what's the retention been after two years? I don't, again, I don't have that data with me. We can pull that. Um, I, I would say in that program that it, it's not not good. Not good, right. No, but uh, uh, one of the things with that program is that uh, the initial cohort was, was at Peck, and so when the principal of Peck, who was a TFA alum, left to go to a charter school, many of those original yes. cohort members went with her right. to that school. So that was the original cohort. Now, we're now, we have a lot of um, TFAers in their second year now mm -hmm. who will, you know, will be That'll be a, we'll see how many of them stay. The challenge with TFA is many of the folks are not necessarily committed, some, I shouldn't say many, some are not committed to education for their career, right? So they want to go on to do something else. But secondly, many of them are not from the area. Um, they, um, you know, while I will say the quality has been very, in my opinion, I'm speaking for myself, the, um, the quality has been very strong in Holyoke of the TFAers we have received. Their, um, the longevity is our biggest concern with mm -hmm. them. And it doesn't help our retention numbers if they're in for two and then out after two years. So that's why I think, um, and we don't know, we don't, I don't see them as the long-term strategy. They were great when we had nothing um, initially. We didn't have Teach Western Mass. We didn't have, uh, the Mount Holyoke program was just launching. We didn't have Elms. I don't see that as a long-term, it would be great. I mean, I think the quality is great, but I, I'm not, I'm not convinced that in terms of long-term retention, that that's, that that's going to be, that the, the, their candidates are the strategy for that. Uh, and and I, I'm not going to get into my own personal thoughts and I, views I, 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 of, yeah. of Team yeah. for America right now, <laughs> but I think that if, especially in the Western Mass region where they're trying to recruit, mm -hmm. I think if, they're, if they are committed to providing educators in this area, then they really have to recruit differently. And it needs to be a much more localized approach I to agree. We agree with local that, yeah. colleges around here. And I just don't know if I, we are, Western Mass just is not glamorous for a uh, TFA recruit, mm -hmm. um, having been through some of their info sessions and what is promised out uh, with things or what, it is hard to compete to lure someone to the greater Springfield area when they could also go to New York City or to uh, Miami, Miami, or even Boston. Bo <laughs> yeah, like it's yeah. it's. So I just it's like I said. Even aside from my real thoughts about what TFA is, I just don't know if it yep. suits it. having someone for two years. Definitely doesn't suit us at all, uh, and it it hurts a school culture and hurts students more than it than anything else. But it just, I mean, I I would be happy if you could pick one school and we could get to fifteen percent of uh, TFA people staying uh, longer, staying on to a building. I, I think three is really ambitious uh, with that and not consolidating it down to, to some of the schools. Yeah, we just didn't want to, I think we didn't want to be boxed into having just one school that was the TFA school. Mm -hmm. But I also, I mean, again. Maybe uh, had a, I'd probably have problems with that too. Yeah, right. But, uh, we, we, uh, <laughs> but our strategy has definitely changed. I mean, when we for, TFA was one of the first partners when I first came here that we brought, right? We didn't have, uh, we had no pipelines. Uh, as you can see, we're, it's a much more regionalized approach because I would agree with you. I mean, it isn't in the best interest of our kids. I do appreciate the talent. 
um, and the, the influx that they have brought. But I also realize that in the long term, mm -hmm. that's not in the best interest of our kids. I don't think we should, I think we should still have a relationship with them because I do think it diversifies like the overall, you know, um, it's a, another pipeline in for, for staff. But I don't think, um, you know, as, as we move on, I think the ones you've heard of, heard about before, and especially this new relationship with Elms has, I think, a tremendous, you know, tremendous potential. Promise, uh, yeah. Yeah, for us as a system. Yeah, and I would just add that um, working with TFA, it seems like they they have kind of had the same realization that, um, you know, it can't work to just recruit someone from California to come to Massachusetts and expect they're going to stay for five to 10 years, right? Like, so they are aware of that. They're participating more in some of the same partner work groups that we have um, and just making a commitment um, publicly stating that they're going to do more to recruit locally. So it's encouraging um, and, and it, it feels like it is aligned to the direction that we want to go. So I think with that, I'm going to hand it over to Kelly to talk a little bit about um, our pathway for candidates without a bachelor's degree. Great. So um, the first one is um, ELMS again, but um, for candidates without a bachelor's degree, right now we have 35 paraprofessionals with bachelor's degree degrees, and we almost have 200 um, paras. So we we want to get to the pairs that don't have any degree or just an associate's degree to help them get to a bachelor's degree. And like Beth said, Elms has been very accommodating and has worked with us to try to um, get as many pairs that are interested in teaching in there. So um, we were hoping to get funding for this portion by the teacher diversification grant. They chose not to fund this part of the grant, which was a little disappointing, but um, there is support through the teacher preparation grant, which is um, not through DESE. So um, ELMS helps the paraprofessionals who are interested in this navigate that grant and um, begin. We're hoping to find some money to help supplement some of the costs. Um, and um, that's still in discussion. Yeah. And, and just to clarify on that, so we would actually be obligated for the amount listed there um, for the program. So Dr. Zreich, Anthony Soto, and I are working through to, to really identify, since we didn't get that funding, like what we are reasonably able to offer in this upcoming year to support candidates going through this. Um, when the last time we pulled our data, we had approximately 35 paraprofessionals with their bachelor's degree, another 35 who had an associate's degree. Um, so this is really doubling the, the pool of candidates that we have who can enter into these pipelines by addressing this area. Um, also just adding before I hand it back over to Kelly, um, just fo the reason we're focusing so much on the paraprofessionals is um, where our teacher diversification grant is around, I'm sorry, teacher diversification is around 22 to 23%. Our para diversification is around 65% um, like people of color. So that matters in this work. I think also 65% of our paraprofessionals live here in Holyoke, whereas about 35% of our teachers live here in Holyoke. So this is a pool that we are definitely targeting to enter into these pipelines that we have and anything you guys can do to help us promote and support that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, Ms. Burks. So I think the programs are great. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start off with that. Um, this one in particular, you know, I think we do need to look at that student cost of $1,000. Our paraprofessionals barely make a livable wage. Yeah. Um, and when you're looking at some of these other numbers and the supports that they're getting, the people that we really need, um, really need that grant funding more um, than some of those other positions. People with bachelors and masters, you know, have a tendency to bring in more money. Our paraprofessionals don't get paid a livable wage. Mm -hmm. I mean, being 100% yeah. honest, and the fact that we're asking them to come up with a thousand dollars a year, those are the those, and I agree, those are the people that we do need yes. teaching our classrooms because yep. 
Can yeah, and I can speak a little bit to that, and then I'll hand it over Go to ahead, you, Dr. Zray. Um, yep. So uh, they have certainly been aware of that. Don't forget, none of this takes into consideration any financial aid that's available. So we have talked to Elms College about that, and they have said, um, reasonably speaking, like depending on what their salary is, it's likely that they're going to get something like a Pell Grant or something along those lines to help reduce even that $1,000 a year. Yeah. I would just say... Um, you're absolutely right, but um, this is where I, I'm at odds with the state on this, is I don't agree, and we've had this conversation yeah. internally. Yes. This is not what we applied for. We got the money for, we, we put everything in. We applied for everything, for all these programs. What we really wanted the money for was for this program, because I agree with you 100% on that. On that. I, I do, and I also think that my opinion about the strategy for recruitment and retention in Western Mass and Holyoke has changed in the last four years. And I've, we've, I've had that conversation with the commissioner that this is, in fact, that this is the body of people we need to invest in. While the, pay, the payout, is, take, it takes longer, right, because they have to complete their bachelor's. It, it has the single best chance, in my opinion, of strengthening the workforce here and retaining staff. I think that as a school committee, this is a place where we have to continue to push at the state level too, because I do think, um, I, I and you know the the issue for us now is for us to do what you're saying, we're going to have to pull from our operating budget to invest. I'm not opposed to it because it's not huge right. money, but it's the right kind of investment, um, and, and because the state grant won't allow us, or they didn't grant us any money for this program, so. I, I would. I, I, yeah, I don't want to take away from how appreciative we are of true. receiving that grant, but you, but this is certainly something that was on our list of priorities, which is why we're not just leaving it now that we didn't get the funding. We're just trying to find other solutions yeah. on on how to make this work. I just want to also say I hope that you guys are really reaching out and working with paraprofessionals um, to help to help them be successful yes. with going through. Um, and pushing them forward because a lot of times they don't have enough faith in themselves right. to think that they could really do it. And 90% of them are doing it on a daily basis and not getting credit for all the work they do. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up. But and this we is will. Important to me. We'll talk a little bit more to that later in the presentation, too, because um, that's certainly some of the learning that we've had in this work. Mr. Kershane? Is there, um, is there a way to spread that cost over the course of a year and maybe take it out of their pay pre-tax, whatever portion they have to? Um, I know that we've tried to do that with Teach Western Mass, and we couldn't. The attorneys all said that it was illegal. So, Sounds like the wrong um, attorney. <laughs> so, but, but again, like it's certainly not something – that like we want to give up on so we can keep looking into that. It's something that we've thought about um, or, or finding other creative ways to maybe like increase their salary so that they can pay that thousand dollars a year. Yeah. It sounds like an accountant question actually. You know, yeah, so. I think they would have to meet with the financial aid office, and, and I bet they wouldn't even end up paying $1,000 after they did that. Like Beth said, there's grants available, um, especially when you have a low income to help them with that. And these figures are from Elms, and it's like an estimate. So I'm pretty sure that they would be able to support them, and they wouldn't end up paying $1,000. Mr. Sheehan? Yeah. Sorry. So why isn't the TEACH grant being offered for Elms? It is. Oh, not the TEACH grant isn't because you have to be, um, you have to have a bachelor's degree, I believe. Nope. It's for a baccalaureate program as well. It's baccalaureate, post-baccalaureate, or master's program. Oh, so it, it could have something to do with the teacher preparation grant. I don't know if you qualify for both. Is that? Yeah, I'm not I mean, sure it, either. I, I think that that's something. I mean, that would. When we talked to Elms, they didn't think that the teach grant was applicable to this group that we were um, trying to fund. But the teacher pair professional teacher preparation grant is which is more money than that because this is $7,500 a year. The TEACH grant, I believe, is just $3,500 a year. And since, yeah, that's total for two years oh, for the okay. Urban Teacher Pathway Program. It's two years, so it's 7000 Yeah. And I would also like to learn more about this whole not being able to do payroll deductions, too, to cover that. Okay. Um, like Mr. Kershane brought up, like that, 
I think I know why that was said, but I would like to know what the attorney's reasonings are for helping these people and not being able to do a standard payroll deduction. Yeah, for those. It, it, and it actually wasn't our attorneys. It was their attorneys who said that it couldn't be done. So um, we can certainly... The Elms attorneys? No, um, t we tried it with Teach Western Mass. Oh, okay. Um, so we can look into it and get another yeah. opinion yeah. on that. Well, I, I'm assuming they would want the district to be a basically be able to support it if the person quits or something and doesn't have the additional payroll deductions coming out is my what I'm guessing is um, that they could yeah. lose out on it if we were making payments to them every on a 26 week schedule is my guess mm -hmm. why their attorneys wouldn't want it because if someone bailed in the middle of the program then they don't get paid their full fee but I mean at least for this for the para one I mean it, it's different this Mrs. Burke said like paras are different than people that are teaching um so I mean it could be something that is made specifically for this program to incentivize a program like that, that maybe you could get it done as a, a standard payroll deduction. Yeah, we'll certainly look into that and the TEACH grant for this program as well. And with that, any I'll other questions? Hand it back over to Kelly to continue. All right, so student to teacher and staff development. Um, the student to teacher piece is very exciting to me because I feel like if we were able to do this five years ago, we would have had yes. 30 teachers in the classroom right now. Um, so Generation Teach is one of the programs that allows our high school t um, students to teach middle school students along with um, some other um, college students. Uh, and our teachers are able to be their coaches. So it gives our teachers a leadership opportunity. It gives our students a teaching opportunity and um, our middle school students get to have fun. Um, so we use Generation Teach to try to recruit um, college students to work in Holyoke when they complete their um, education. We've had a couple of our high school students participate, and I think they've been some of the best teachers. Um, and so the, um, the requirements is that they're they represent the diversity and excellence of the students and communities we serve, which is why our high school students are perfect. The students get a stipend for working, and um, our teachers who are coaches get a stipend also. And they work with our middle school students. I think I said that. So the other... Um, Last year, we started the Future Teachers Signing Day. It's similar to Sports Signing Day, where students who want to be um, teachers get, um, get recognized for their commitment to teaching, not necessarily committing to Holyoke, but we encourage them to commit to Holyoke by offering them a step up on our um, compensation system if they do return to Holyoke, and we promise them placement and a student teaching um, opportunity. And we're planning on doing that again this year. Did you want to say anything else about that, Dr. Drake? No. Future just teachers? make sure you uh, click the slides oh. there. Yeah. Thank you. I should have given it to Beth. No, no, that's right. <laughs> um, and then recently, um, through the Teacher Diversification Grant, we were able to start planning um, UMass Grow Your Own for our future teachers in Holyoke. And we're actually meeting Friday to firm up some of the details. We're um, excited to partner with UMass and have a future teachers club where they'll meet regularly. We haven't determined the amount of times they'll meet after school, but it, it'll most likely be weekly or biweekly. They'll have a course in the spring connected to ethnic studies where they will receive graduate um, college credits that are transferable to a few colleges. And um, they will also visit UMass frequently to get the college exper experience and there'll be a mentor um, that'll work with them to determine whether or not um, they want to be a teacher, what content area they want to be in, and support any questions they may have, along with a, one of the Hoyoke High School teachers running the Future Teachers Club. Did I miss anything, Beth? I think just acknowledging that like year one is really about the planning with UMass. Um, it's a heavy lift to roll something like this out um, where they're going to have the dual enrollment, making sure it doesn't interfere with their high school experience while they're gaining that experience at UMass. 
And we're also hoping to um, incorporate Generation Teach. So we're hoping these future teachers get to teach this summer in Generation Teach and tie that into um, what they're learning um, at UMass. They're trying to plan a one credit course from that experience. Um, so that's exciting. Oh, Ms. Burke, sorry. Okay, so I have more questions. Yeah. yeah. I'm new, so I'm totally All right, ask away. So how much does Generation Teach cost us as a district? So what, is it, what does it cost to have them in? Hawaii? It has varied from year to year. Um, this year to run the whole summer program, it, it's a hundred fifty for us, I believe, is the overall cost. Yeah, we paid for it in... Uh, so first of all, it does. It is our summer school. It is a summer yes. school program, um, and so we use our summer funding for that. Um, at different times, we've used the um, the turnaround money has has funded this, uh, and I'm not sure where we're going to get the funding exactly for this year. Whether it's our operating budget or turnaround money, but that's what. Yeah, it's about 150 thousand. Right. And then my next question is for the generation teach. It says undergraduate and high school students. Like I think this is. I think this is cool for our high school students to yeah. recommend. Um, is there a difference in the stipend, like, for the kids yeah. that are majoring in an education and no. college now? No, no. High school there's not kids? a difference. It's the it, same stipend. Yeah, and I forgot to mention that they get an intensive two-week training prior to um, the start of the summer program. And are we going out to the local colleges to speak to – all of the ed majors right. at those colleges? So they do have a recruiter that does go to colleges to speak to ed majors, not ed majors. They're hoping they get people that want to begin teaching that weren't originally thinking about it, and they have this experience, and it changes their mind, which um, we should invite you to the panel that they do in the summer. We get to um, question the, the middle school students and the teachers, the high school or undergraduate and they tell us about their experience and um, whether or not they're going to teach or not. They have a local director who's from Holyoke, actually. She, yeah, she graduated uh, she from graduated here, from Dean. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she does the recruiting um, between now, I would assume, and when, uh, when the summer program starts. So are we taking the students that um, from Generation Teach and are we rolling them into these rest of these programs that you guys have? Trying. So we're hoping like, to, yeah. yeah. That's the hope. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Trying hard. It, it. We only have one person right now because Gen Generation Teach started maybe Long two term. years ago. Yeah. Uh, we have one person that is now a teacher at Sullivan that began at Generation Teach. But we, it's not as strong of the p connection as we want to make. It's yet. amazing because I know at least four students um, from when I worked at Sullivan School, for instance, um, that are now Holyoke Public School teachers that have just graduated college yeah. You know, within the last year or two. Um, and I just think, like, if we had done more, um, they'd probably mm -hmm. be walking away with less student loans. Um, and they're already serving our district, and they don't want to go anywhere. Um, so yep. I'm just thinking, like, that that would be phenomenal. We lost. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're here, and they're teaching, but we lost, you know, the ability to help them back. Yeah, it's also be great if you – I mean, I know you – I just happen to know you have some um, college-age children or um, – and to be able to spread the word to that group because those are the people we want. And we don't always know. We don't do a, a strong enough job of tracking who from, like, who's juniors and seniors in college who are from Holyoke and want to teach in our schools, making sure that we're making the connection to bring them back here. And Generation to Teach is a great way to get them a little taste of it. Yep. And if they want to. Department of um, Elementary and Secondary Education is actually doing that job for us because they're actually recruiting. Um, yep. They were at my daughter's college because my daughter is now a med uh, ed major um, in her junior year, about to graduate, and she's in an accelerated program. And the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed was selling Holyoke. Oh, was it for the Inspired program? Uh, no, they just asked for a meet and greet with the students. And actually, Mr. Riley was there um, in a group of his cohorts. Um, recruiting students from her college yeah. that are all ed majors and recruiting for Holyoke as well. Awesome. So We have some teachers that are in Holyoke, like Miss Banks at Sullivan School. Some, I think many of you know Lori Banks. She's a, a fellow who does, she does that work for the department in, uh, not in, in the, nor, not on the South Shore, but that does it at UMass 
I don't know, Kelly, where else did they she go? She visits several different colleges. We, um, last year it was just her, but now we have two um, inspired fellows. Okay. Janaea Little, I believe yep. her last name is. Yep. Yeah, and they go to co- local colleges and um, I'm assuming other fairs and stuff like that and try to turn non-education majors into education majors or education majors to come to Holyoke. They also, uh, the department has a, a campaign right now going to really try to change the narrative around teaching, where I think it's kind of had like a negative story um, in the, the past few years. They're really trying to change that. Um, so it, there's some exciting things going on at the state level, too, to get more interest in teaching. So is your daughter going to come teach, Becky? Um, I would <laughs> love if you could recruit her because... That'd be great to get her back in this area. But <laughs> Ellie, call her, to, call her tomorrow. Yeah, right. I'll call her tomorrow. I'll, her, I'll face her number. I'd love if you could bring yeah. her back this way. But. And, and the four teachers that you're talking about, they can always take advantage of the Urban Teacher Pathway Program to get their master's. But they're already current Holyoke Public School teachers. They're yeah. Already. So our current, some of our current teachers are taking that because they might have a waiver. Awesome. So, or they might want to change to special education or ELL. Yeah. I think you're going the wrong direction. <laughs> so um, I can go to that. I think we're here. Yeah. So I'll let. Yeah, I'll let Beth say this. Becky, you'll be interested in because this is speaks to the point you made earlier. Yes. Um, so uh, also at that diversity network where we were talking with Mark Swagger and Stephen Mogel. Um, one of our big concerns is that we've had, for example, the urban teacher pathway for many years now. Um, we typically budget for about eight slots every year, and we have not filled all of those slots any years. <laughs> so we were trying to dig into that a little bit more, and, and what we really came up with is there is this trust and confidence issue that exists. So this is something um, that I think brings me a lot of joy in my work, um, and something we're really focused on this year is really developing this advanced professional development track for paraprofessionals. Um, this is being developed currently. Um, the concept that we have right now is that they will receive robust professional development courses that relate to teaching um, to help smooth that transition from being a paraprofessional to a classroom teacher. Being a teacher is hard. <laughs> it's extremely hard in your first year. So anything we can do to build that skill set and build their confidence to make that transition is going to be really important in this work. Um, so our idea is they have this professional development and then um, they kind of they work in the summer program and they'll teach um, some portion every single week, whether it's like one lesson a week where they have like a teacher to provide them feedback, help them prepare for it. So they're really getting hands on experience without having to make any sort of commitment. Right. Because I think right now there's like this fear, like I'm going to lose my position. I have to take this one. I don't know if I'm going to be successful in it. So we're trying to help them explore their opportunities. And if they decide that they don't want to be a teacher, it's still going to benefit them in their current role. Um, so the idea behind this, too, is that we all agreed that it has to be a paid opportunity. So um, the time that they're going to be spending, um, summer school has always been paid. But additionally, we're looking to pay them for all of the professional development hours and then finding coaches to pay throughout the school year to help them continue that work in the following school year and having um, a specialized track during the district PD days for them to attend. So that moves us on to um, really, we just have this slide to kind of summarize a lot of work. Um, so as you'll see, like our thought right now is really about like the development of our staff. Um, we're starting on as early as like our paraprofessional positions and really thinking about that as a way to like move up through the pipeline. Um, and then from there, 
as you've seen in probably the collective bargaining agreements and throughout other presentations, we are developing a lot of other teacher leadership opportunities within the district. Um, some of our major ones are listed here, such as the advanced teacher um, which is really designed right now to be like a lab classroom where our novice teachers can go in and observe best practices and debrief and really build their own skill set. Um, the master teacher is a role that we will be rolling out for this next school year. Um, this one will only be in the classroom a certain percentage of the time, um, but and will focus more on like coaching, um, whether it be novice teachers or teachers who may be struggling in certain areas um, to really elevate the quality of practice. Um, and then our academy leads at the high school who are doing a lot with the high school redesign. Um, there's... There's pages of opportunities that we actually create every single year um, that give different leadership opportunities, like the instructional leadership team in each building um, and other opportunities like that. That was quite the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no, you guys offer a lot of opportunities. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Well, thank you guys so much for, for bringing this to us. Great presentation. One more thing. I hope Mike can share this on the screen for anyone who wants to re help us recruit. And if you have, uh, if you know of people, send them to Kelly. You know, if you have people that are interested, she, she's the one-stop shop that can answer all these qu questions. I know it gets a little confusing of each of the models, but please, if you know quality people, we want them working in our schools. So please, uh, you know, Kelly's the, that's why her role exists, <laughs> to be that ambassador. So she Kelly, does a great job at it. I think you all know how to get a hold of me, yeah. too. No, <laughs> actually, on TV Day, don't. So go ahead and give your 413. <laughs> My cell phone? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so uh, I can be emailed at kcurran, K-C-U-R-R-A-N, at hps.holyoke.ma.us. Excellent. Well, thank you again for thank coming. You. Thank, thank you. you for having us. Good job. Awesome. Perfect. Moving along on to um, superintendent receiver correspondence. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'll be. I'll try to. I have a number of things I just want to touch on uh, that are, I think are pretty important. One um, next meeting we are going to talk. I'm going to introduce the new director of social emotional and behavior learning. Uh, he wasn't able to be here tonight because it was his wife's 40th birthday, oh. uh, or birthday. I shouldn't be giving ages out. Sorry, oh. um, but um, it's already there. <laughs> he's uh, it's already out there. Uh, but I want him to. I want him to. Uh, I want him to. I want you all to have a chance to meet him and um, ask him questions. He has been. He has visited every school now in the last since we got back. So, um, and to understand what some of the challenges are around social emotional learning in each school. Uh, we're also going to follow up on the high schools. If you remember, two meetings ago, we talked about uh, questions around inf providing parents with information around uh, grades. And then we also talked about some of the achievement data. So we're going to do that at the next uh, meeting. Um, the um, Around the uh, Puerto Rican, uh, or the earthquake in Puerto Rico, uh, we are meeting as a leadership team. Now that we have a, a chief of social, emotional, and behavioral learning, we have a point person that can help us with coordinating our response. The high school has a meeting uh, to, uh, in the morning. They have many of the newcomers in the newcomer academy are profoundly affected by the earthquake because their families um, are there. They recently, their recent arrivals. They also have the trauma of having just left after the hurricane. So uh, the high school has a meeting, and then some of their representatives are going to come to the district level. We're going to talk about what our um, support efforts are going to look like district-wide. So I just wanted to, I sent, I did send you a copy of the note I sent out to teachers today. Um, the um, one thing that uh, Liz and I discussed that I wanted you to be aware is we are going to start translating the minutes of these meetings into Spanish, uh, beginning with this meeting, Liz. Okay. Now that we have a more um, evolved and uh, stronger translation interpretation department, we have a mechanism by which we can do that. And so we're going to begin posting the minutes in both uh, languages. Um, so uh, thank you for Liz, to Liz for taking that on. Um, I do want to talk about the Student Opportunity Act. I'm getting a lot of questions about when are we going to know, how are we going to, uh, how is this going to be rolled out. So um, I, I was just informed, the governor's budget comes out, I believe, January 23rd. Devin may know the exact date. Is that the right date? So um, 
in the days following that, the Department of Ed is going to release the template that each district has to fill out around and the checklist. And that's not just for receivership districts. That's for any district that's receiving significant amount of funds like we are. I thought that was getting released Friday. I was told by somebody today at the department that it's okay. not going to be till after, but you may have other information. I just thought it was an the associate commissioner Friday. told me. Oh, he's going to talk about it at okay. the urban zoo. But the actual template, uh, we're going to. Uh, I'm told the final template will be released after that. I do uh, expect to um, in, uh, set up some community engagement um, opportunities for the public, and I would ha ask that you help me to get people to attend who have ideas about. You know, I want to get input from the community about ways. About how to spend the money, yeah. I mean, there's about 800 different ways, but I think part of the, I do believe one of the requirements is to engage the community anyway, but regardless of the fact, um, I think that's something we need to do. So just to keep that on your radar, probably February, uh, beginning of February before break, and then maybe do two different forums around that. The Arts Task Force, we launched an Arts Task Force. Um, we have a professional facilitator. Aaron Vega was instrumental in helping get this off the ground. We have a really strong group of people who are educators in the system. We have funders. We have higher ed folks. We have uh, all kinds of um, arts organizations there. We need a school committee rep there. I'd love to have a school committee rep there. If you're interested, you don't have to tell me now. Please send me an email. But I think it's important that we have a, a, a voice at the table from the school committee at, at these sessions. Again, this is this is being done by the woman who did the Berkshire Arts Plan, very reputable. This is going to be, and we're, we're working to per develop a strategic plan for the arts in the Holyoke Public Schools. And Aaron and I are the co-chairs. Really, Aaron is the, I have no arts background, but I know it's important. Um, and I think, and I, we have a lot of our educators um, who have been saying all along, like, we don't have a strong pipeline into the high school around arts. And I think all of you know it's inconsistent, it's choppy, um, and some kids get a good experience, some do not. Um, so please let me know if you're interested. Um, I did know there is a job posting here for the uh, district physician. We are reposting that position. We do not have a current contract with our um, physician, and we do feel like the role can be stronger, more, uh, and have more connection to our work and to the community's work. Um, and so we're also looking about whether the stipend is enough. It's been 5000 for a while. I haven't touched this at all since I've been here. We've just had the same physician, and we've offered the same stipend. But um, we're, now in a, we're now learning that uh, we now believe that the role can do more, and so we're posting um, uh, the position. Um, I would note that we are partnering with the Sandy Hook Promise uh, around um, uh, – Ending isolation, social isola isolation for students. They are they they started after the Sandy Hook tragedy around um, examining um, school connectedness for people that um, you know feel um, isolated in school, and they are coming and presenting to all six to twelfth graders January thirteenth through fifteenth in the Holyoke Public Schools. Letters are going out to families if they haven't just explaining what it is. I should have provided a copy. I will provide you with a copy of what that looks like. Um, and um, the dual language grant we just got awarded um, is um, helpful, but we are. I have a meeting tomorrow with the superintendent of Amherst Public Schools and the dean of education at UMass. Um, we are, they are offering this course that we, our teachers are – um, who are dual language teachers have to get recertified, have to get a, a, a new endorsement to teach dual language. It is highly involved, and they are, teachers are very concerned about the requirements and not happy about the requirements. Um, we have a grant that allows us to subsidize the cost of the course, but the course is very involved, and it's another barrier to getting teachers, um, you know, what they need. And it's going to, we believe it's going to de- uh, um, disincentivize folks to want to teach dual language because it's adding another layer to the requirement. Um, the other, so we are working on. Uh, I think Mike Morris, the superintendent there, feels the same way. But we are, so we are working with the dean. We expect that the UMass is, I think, overchar. We believe is overcharging for the course. Also, we don't want our teachers to have to pay anything out of pocket, and we'd also like to see it more um, online. 
than it is like actual seat time, which is very inconvenient for teachers. So te there is um, an outcry from some of our staff, um, especially ones that have been teaching dual language. Um, yes, question. So this is a new, so like all of our current staff now have to get this and then incoming staff for next year? They either have to pass a test, which has not been developed yet, or they have to um, take courses, which we now, we subsidize, but it's six, right now it's six courses. Starting when? Um, I think they have a grace period of a couple of, like two years to do this, but it's, I'm not, I'm concerned and I have raised my concern. The other thing, just I want to give you the full picture of my concerns. That's one. The other is we have some teachers now who are teaching on the Spanish, um, the Spanish side of the dual language who do not, will never pass the teacher test because their English isn't strong enough, but they don't have to teach in English, right? So we have a number, uh, we have a few teachers who are excellent at what they do. Some of you know who they are, but they do not ever have to teach in English. They only have to teach in Spanish. My concern about those teachers is that the requirement for them to be a teacher in Massachusetts is to pass the teacher test. They'll pass any endorsement test. I mean, the, uh, the uh, bilingual endorsement, they can certainly pass a test that they can teach in Spanish, but they will not be able to pass the teacher test. There's, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So don't a lot, I, I don't want to generalize by some of the teachers that you're talking about, but Many of them probably had the old TBE license, right? No, some of them are recent arrivals from, um, um, so we have some from Puerto Rico. Uh, we have a teacher I know from Colombia who's excellent, who, um, you know, her Spanish is impeccable, and I would want her teaching my child Spanish. But, uh, so I thought, and so if you had an old TBE license that, that got converted over, Yeah, right? you could, that, but very, very few of our teachers have that old TBE license. And didn't a foreign language license also allow you to? Um... I don't think the foreign language license does allow you to, no, no, no. Um, so the problem is for that, that, and then there's some of our teachers who were former um, ESL teachers in the system are saying that the coursework is duplicative of what they've already taken with the SEI endorsement. So I, I, I rest assured, I, we met with the teachers, they shared all their concerns and were advocating, but it is, it is baked in the, the, um, the law, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the bilingual ed law, or I'm sorry, the, um, yeah, the bilingual ed law that requires um, these, this coursework. It is a pro it's going to be a problem for our teachers. Um, so it's just something to be aware of. Well, out of the 800 ideas, there you go. Boom. You know, it's <laughs> In terms one. of, <laughs> right. Right. I mean, we already have a hard time recruiting for dual yes. language. Yes, yes, exactly. And and the, their que the question they're asking is, why would we want to teach dual language if we know that it's that much more involved to become a dual language teacher, even though they love their job, they love the work that they do. But it's a fair question for them to ask. Ms. Burks? It, the same issue, though, with our um, language learners that are taking an MCAS that's in English. And it should really be in Spanish for them. For the, you mean for same as for teachers, yeah, who are, yeah. <clears throat> well, again, I'm my concern with the teachers is they do. We're, we're not asking them to teach in English. We're asking them to teach only in Spanish, and we and in some ways, it might it is better that they, because the purity of their Spanish is so strong, that it's um it's good for kids who are developing. Their second language, Spanish. So, <clears throat> um, I will conclude. That concludes my comments. What happened with the school physician medical consultant role and responsibilities? I talked about that. You did. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I have a question. <laughs> okay. Really quick, just and I and I pointed it out to you um, when we're looking at regular basis, it really doesn't emphasize a specific time frame when the consultation will occur and when they will be meeting with that the director of health. So it has to be more clear. Is it okay. going to be quarterly? Is it going to be monthly? Is it going to be twice a year? Yep. Whatever the case may be. And then I see here the school health advisory council. You're asking for someone for the arts task force. 
Um, maybe someone for the school health advisory council from the school committee. So if anybody's so you're, interested, you're suggesting that a school committee yes, member please. be on that committee. Yep. Okay. Huh? No, not. No, and um, just to let, remind um, for the joint school committee, city council, uh, any school committee member that is interested, please let me send me an email um, so that we can appoint someone as soon as possible. So by Friday. Um, either email, phone, text, SOS, whichever the case may be, um, for that. And, um, oh, could you give us an update as to what we're doing in regards to the middle school project? Um, aren't we supposed to, by January 25th, was Devin, it? Devin would like to take that one. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Actually, before I take that, I just wanted to mention something about um, Dr. Drake mentioned the Sandy Hook promise. And just so people are aware, if anyone's watching at home or for all of you, if you have questions about it, the programs that they're doing with children are not focused at all about trauma around that. And I know there's been a lot of questions with that because the Sandy Hook promise actually has many different topics they talk about. These are focused more about students being other observers to students, like, do you need a friend? Are you in isolation? Things like that. So it's not a, um, because they offer, if you go to the St. Dick Promise website, there's many different things they talk about, but the ones they're offering to school districts in Massachusetts are focused more on um, things like buddy benches and different things like that. To If you see a kid sitting alone in the cafeteria, and I'm really minimalizing the efforts, but that's, what it's about. So the, the school building project, um, Dr. Zreich, the mayor, um, Councilor McGee Lisi, and Lisi and I all met uh, yesterday, it seems much longer ago, but uh, um, uh, we met yesterday and we followed up on a, uh, on a follow up on a message that Dr. Zreich had received from the MSBA uh, needing some financial information from the city. So once the city provides the financial information uh, to the MSBA, we'll kind of know what some options are. Um, right now, the MSBA process, as it's defined in their regulations, is that anyone who wants to submit a project submits a statement of interest between uh, January 8th and October 8th, and then it's acted upon uh, after that at some point. Um, we are um, hoping that there might be a different... Uh, method for us to take, given the work that was already put into it, but there's just some questions that the MSBA needs first before they even want to get into those kind of discussions and what we're going to do. Uh, and I know that's really not a great update, and I don't know if you can add anything else to it, but it... Yeah, the only thing is the window opened this tomorrow, right, yeah. for yeah. the uh, statement of interest between tomorrow and April. April is it April 8th? Um, but that... You know, we're waiting. I, 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 for our application to go in, I, we need more gu direction, and we've been told um, to wait till we get that direction. And once the um, school building authority has our financials, um, they're going to be able to then direct us on where we go. I did follow up after the meeting with the MSBA yesterday. Just to, I want to keep the communication between us um, constant. Um, and they appreciated the fact that we met, and I explained to them what was discussed. And so, um, you know, I hope that in our February meeting we have an update um, because the window is the window's now. And I, I, you know, we're not. I mean, one of my goals before I transition away is to have the middle school pl a plan uh, to, around where we're going with our middle school buildings. So um, I feel a, a tremendous, tremendous sense of urgency around that. And I think one thing that's important, I mean, we we went through everything in the fall and we don't need to rehash that, but I think it's it's well known that the the voters had said that the the project was not gonna go through with a debt exclusion. So no matter what the project is, this I believe, and this is me speaking from everything that I hear, that a project needs to be um yep. fully funded and bonded for within the levy limit of the city. Uh, without having to go for a vote of whatever that may look like. I mean, that was, I believe that that was loud and clear with that. So that's some of the financial information that the um, the city has to provide to the MSBA uh, in terms of uh, what the city is able to do within 
uh, our existing confines, I would say. I, I think that's how we all left that meeting, too. Yeah, that's fair. Wait, Mr. Hushane? Um, so, I mean, what does it take to make this happen with regard to pressure? You had two city councilors in the room. Did they offer, you know, a solution for us? Is there something that they can propose and forum or I, well, there's no there, there's no solution we're looking for right now and give me just one second and i will tell you exactly what the um msba asked for what i i don't mean the solution to how we our approval uh is i, I mean getting these getting our city to provide the information that was requested how do we how can we push that issue? Right. So this is what the MSBA is looking for prior to um, even any information of what the process is going to look like is they need clarity and documentation to the MSBA regarding how much the city of Hoyle can contribute to a building project given its current financial constraints to ensure that the aforementioned documentation is reviewed and endorsed by the Division of Local Services prior to sharing with the MSBA, and three, set up a time with it. MSBA leadership in the next three to four weeks to review and discuss the financial informa information provided. So does that mean that has to go through um, the city council? Um, so th there's no commitment to anything. This is, this is the MSBA is asking for fact finding and they want facts presented to them. After they get those facts, they will be able to inform us whether there could be a different process that we go through. Um, some people call it an expedited process. I'm not going to call anything expedited, but a alternative process that we can go through or the normal submission process. Um, I believe a statement of interest, regardless, still gets approved by the city council yeah. before it's submitted. So I do not imagine either process that we go through, whether it's an alternative process or the traditional process, that there wouldn't be a step of having to at least go to the city council and ask for submission of that, um, just that, that statement of interest or whatever it may be. So once those that information is provided by the city of Holyoke to the Mass School Building Authority, they will inform us what would be the best option for us to take if, if there truly is an option and not just the one that's established by regulation. What was the second? It was how much can we contribute and then Number two. Certified by Division of Local Services, right? Is that what it was, Steve? Certified by who? Division of Local Services are the, the government branch that kind of looks over all the municipalities and looks over all the finances. So they, we report everything out to them uh, financially, and they just review it. They and say yes. That's yeah, true. Yes. I okay. mean, it's, a, okay. it's their I – mean, I mean, I think they're just – they're auditor. I mean, they, they, that's their job to make sure that everything is accurate. I mean, it's just, yep, everything looks good, and they sign off on it. Right? I mean, that was the process you thought they yep. were taking, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Ms. Tensley-Williams? So the, the city needs to show through their financials that they would have the ability um, to bond for some sort of school construction. Uh, and a school construction project without having to um, do a debt exclusion again. I mean, we know that that failed. I mean, that that is not the will of the voters. So, I mean, they need to know that the city can financially afford within the, the confines of the city budget and taking into account, I mean, there's things that they've taken into account. There, there's debt that will come off of that, that we will lose in the next couple of years. There is... Um, potential for uh, money from the cannabis industry that has not been worked into anything with the financials yet. So there's a, a big picture that needs to be looked at um, with it that for the city uh, of how they can, uh, how they can do this. I, I mean, sure. I, I mean, I don't know. I think it's just the process. I mean, there, the, the, the city, if, if there is the, the um, desire to build um do educational facilities. I mean, the city needs to show that they can provide the funding to to do that. Is there? Um, there was um, as we as we neared the vote, there was a proposal or offer by Desi to allow us to um, lower our uh, contribution um, 
under the debt school spending formula. Is that something that would also go into these figures? That's something I believe yesterday came up that we'd have to factor in. It obviously, I mean, it not the same amount. It may not be the same amount. Like, I mean, but that is something that needs to be look is along with looking at things like what debt is coming off of of the rolls in the next couple of years that is another factor of what money can be contributed in it's one of many different things they have to look at and this is something that's done between the city treasurer the city auditor the tax collector sand revenues and also bringing in cinder mcnerney from hilltop securities who who does the financial forecasting or and bond forecasting for the city to say that this is where we are what, what could we do to put some pressure on to make this happen? I mean, it's... I, I don't. I, I don't think there's a, a pressure point at this point, in, unless okay. Steve, unless you think differently. It's just it, the mayor's office told us yesterday that, and the mayor's chief of staff that they are going to start compiling this information and working with the the treasurer, the tax collector, the auditor, and Cinder to get this together. They're also going to reach out to. Uh, Division of Local Services, who I think is actually their meeting with Thursday. Is that what they said? Either Thursday this week or Thursday uh, next yeah, week. Yeah, at some point the, in the next Within days, the next yeah. two weeks, whoever our contact is with the Division of Local Services who has to kind of give the, the rubber stamp or whatever it may be to this information, they actually have a meeting already. So, I mean, this, okay, okay. this isn't anything that isn't occurring. There, okay, there are okay. things that are going on. Um, and it just so happened yesterday, we were all going to be together, so it was a prime time. Oh, and Aaron Vega was there as well, to come together and meet about this this topic and to see where it's going with next steps. Okay. okay. And we'll keep getting um, information monthly. And um, Okay. I, ideally, we would have it, and we could be submitting our proposal tomorrow. Yes. Right. I mean, yes. We need that, we need that, we need that to happen as soon as possible. Right. Okay. So... If we don't see it happening, then the time to go. And, and just so the yeah. the traditional submission, a submission that occurs between January in the normal statement of interest period, typically by the school building authority is not acted upon until their December meeting. So just, I mean, that's the historical reference of a normal statement of interest process. Like when Steve had to go in December and was there for the withdrawal meeting. The other districts that were being accepted into the process were there that were getting accepted into the process. So, I mean, it, it's that's the typical process. You submit January to April, and then it's voted on at the December meeting. Oh, Ms. Bruno? Do we know what plan we'd even be submitting? So none of that is even – I mean, that came up yesterday, but it really yeah. – there's nothing we can do until we have the finances. Right. Because there's – uh, a million different factors that go into once the finances are there. I mean, it, it's the the plan that Desi has approved and turned right. around, that MSBA says that works, that the district says that works, is that we need middle schools. That is the educational goals and plans of the city. What we can Afford. finance to be able to accomplish that goal, we would need to come back together. So it's really, let's find out what the finances are, let's find out what what the MSBA is doing to continue to help us if there's an alternative route to go on or the normal route and then see from there. I mean, it's, it's a lot of waiting and seeing and in nowhere in any of this is anything not occurring or need pressure on at this point. There's no, I don't believe there's any phone calls that need to be made or anything that needs to be done to accelerate anything. It's, it's moving along the process. It's just moving along the process. All right. Well, any other new business? Nope. Old business? Oh, Mr. Colmer. Yeah. I'd like to really thank the uh, students and the staff at the Ian White School for their performance in, at the uh, inauguration. It was really an inspiring thing for our show our, our students off to the public, what, what's going on in our school system, and also to Mark Todd and mm -hmm. his choral group. And I think, you know, we as a group should send a letter thanking them for uh, what they've done for us. Absolutely. Liz? <laughs> Liz got it. Excellent. Uh, Ms. Burks? I just want to congratulate Jack Shea on getting into Harvard. Hi, senior. Um, 
which I think it's just important to acknowledge that. He did a lot of hard work. Um, and he's an amazing kid. And also Trish Harridan, who is currently a Hoyoke High School senior, um, is actually now one of the Hoyoke Colleen. So I would like to congratulate her. And well. Natalie Mako works at Hoyoke High, who is also mm -hmm. one of the Colleen's, who's a recent graduate of Hoyoke High, I think, as well. Cool. So Excellent. Tr Trish, I think, sang yesterday at uh, City Hall, too, with the uh, Madrigals. And I saw on here, um, oh, my God, special education parent advisory meeting. Dr. Zurich, you want to help me with the date? Well, uh, the date is not this Wednesday. It's the next Wednesday. I got to. Oh. oh, man. It's the 22nd. That's when it is. So it's the 22nd at Enlace at 6 p.m., right? Yep, yep. Excellent. So no old business. Um, yep. Any announcements? No announcements. Um, anybody a motion to adjourn? Anyone? All right. Motion and seconded. So meeting adjourned at 812.